First, thank you very much for the invitation and the introduction. It's a pleasure and I'm very happy to be able to give this presentation. I would be even happier to give it in person, but you know, you cannot have everything these days. Um, so yeah, I'm talking about program generation for small scale linear algebra. And um, uh, this is actually the thesis work of Daniele Spampinato, who was a PhD student with me. And I think he did really excellent work there. It's a quite a substantial body of work and I will try to overview sort of all of it. And you see his graduation date. He did uh, then a postdoc at CMU for a little while. And, and now he's back in Switzerland and has moved to industry. Um, okay, so if you like it, uh, what you see is all the credit goes to, to him. So yes, and I have actually the chat open. So if you have a question, if it's not too many questions, so just feel free to type into the chat. I can, uh, I, I probably will be able to, to handle it. And in fact, um, I want to start with a question. So have a look at this here. Does anybody know what that is? So if you know, you can type into the chat. Okay, one correct answer, very good. Give like five more seconds. Okay, very good. Uh, Okay, so yeah, I got a few answers. So yeah, the correct answer is it's a Kalman filter. Okay, indeed it's a Kalman filter as one of these blockbuster control algorithms that's used in, uh, in many applications. And uh, it consists of these two steps that you see here. And this is linear algebra computations that you see here, matrices and vectors uh, that you have to manipulate. And it's used in control, for example, in robotics to control robots of all kinds. It's a basic algorithm and uh, it works with measurements and with states. And the interesting thing here is that typically it is works with small no amounts of numbers, right? So maybe you have six states for a robot and uh, you have few measurements. So what that means is the linear algebra computations that you see here, um, they are very small scale. So the matrices may have size six by six or eight by eight, something like this. Um, however, it is used uh, in uh, often in real-time environments and there are other computations that are running on a processor. So just like for large scale, also here you need fast code, fast implementations for things like this. But it's a small scale implementation, small scale linear algebra. Okay, and we know of course that linear algebra is uh, is, uh, is used in many domains, right? Uh, control systems, optimization algorithms, of course, in machine learning, and of course, in scientific computing. But in these domains that I show here, very often uh, you have small scale linear algebra, right? So you deal with small uh, size matrices and vectors. Okay. So let's have a look at this. Of course, linear algebra is in, in, in some ways, you could argue it's boring, right? It has been studied uh, for, for many, for decades and fast implementations have been developed, there are enormous amount of publications on all kinds of optimized libraries and ways to get them. And so it's a very well understood domain actually, the best understood domain for high performance really. But let's have a look. So here's a Koleski decomposition. That's something you need often and also the Kalman filter. It's implemented in the library at APEC. It's a high performance library that has this funky name that you see here. And here's a performance plot, and we will see a few of those in the presentation. On the x-axis is the size of the matrices, right? So we take a square matrices. And then on the y-axis is percentage of peak performance. So the higher, the better. And you see the Intel math kernel library, which is optimized, achieves quite a nice uh, performance, like 78% of peak performance. So not much more to be done there, really. Um, however, if you go to the small sizes that I just talked about, right, then uh, of course it doesn't look that, that great anymore, right? And of course for very small sizes, you can maybe not get peak performance, but you see the performance drops. So there immediately you see, hey, maybe there's room for improvement here. It's still optimized though, because if you do a straightforward implementation and you compile with a great compiler, um, then, then you get less performance, okay? So the compiler alone cannot give you the performance. And so, for example, with the work that, uh, that uh, Daniele has done here that I will present, 
we can achieve an improvement that you see here. And on top of it, the code is automatically generated. So for no hand coding. Okay, so, um, so what does it take to get fast code? What, what does that mean? I mean, if you, if you are a high performance implementation person, then of course you know perfectly, but not everybody works in this domain. Um, there are many things that you need to do to make code fast. Of course, parallelization is one of them, but maybe not for small scale. But uh, you need to write C code. It needs to have the right code style. You have to care, take care of locality. Uh, you have to do vectorization and so forth. And here I, I have an example of what high performance code looks like. This is not linear algebra. But let me just uh, open this and uh, just show you what kind of code I'm talking about. This here is a high performance implementation of a decoder for LTE. That's a communication standard. And, and this is sort of how high performance code looks. Okay, It looks horrendous. You don't want to write this by hand, really. And uh, you see, it's not even C code because it has these so-called intrinsics in there for vectorization. So when I talk about fast code, highly, highly optimized code, that's the kind of code I'm talking about. And let's go back to the presentation. Good. So um, with this in mind, small scale linear algebra is an important domain and many, many it's a more important topic or it's important in many domains. And the fact that all the libraries that are out there that have been studied for decades typically have been optimized for large scale. Um, our, our goal was to, to try to automate something in this domain, meaning generate high performance code in this domain, okay? Um, the domain has other particularities. When you talk about small scale, very often the sizes are fixed. For example, if you have a Kalman filter, the matrices, the only thing you care about is, is one specific size, right? The states, you have six states, for example, then the dimension is six and you don't want any other dimension. So that's also very different from these typical libraries that cover all sizes. So you want to really generate code specific for the application. So that was the goal. Okay, so, um, so how did we go about this? Um, we tried to structure a little bit the domain of linear algebra. Um, of course, a vast domain uh, to get started somewhere in this project. And, and first, um, sort of the simplest case is when you just have computations on vectors and matrices provided by the linear algebra axioms, right? You multiply matrices by vectors, you multiply by scalars, you add vectors, etc. And we call these basic linear algebra computations. That's the simplest form. <clears throat> However, in many applications, you have actually some structure also in this Kalman filter that maybe some of the matrices may be triangular or symmetric. So you have structure. You'll want to take this into account because it reduces the, the work and we call this, this, this the larger domain of, stru of structure basically in algebra computations. And then you have higher level computations. For example, here, <clears throat> you need to do a triangular solve. <clears throat> which is a higher level uh, computation, or you need to do a Koleski factorization, and we call this higher level in algebra computation, further expands. And then to get something like the Kalman filter, it's sort of yet a, a larger class, which I call here linear, general linear algebra computation, shown by this dot, um, where in essence you compose these lower level computations to entire programs, to entire applications. Um, yeah, so just a higher level computation. And then in essence, what, uh, what we got or Daniele got to in the end is sort of program generation for sort of a subset that you see uh, shown here. Okay, so and that gives also the structure of the talk. We start at the bottom with the simplest compute computations and then we work our way up to more general ones. So part one is about these blocks, basically in the algebra computations. You have matrices, vectors and scalars. And what you can do is you can multiply them and you can add them, and you can transpose them. Okay? And the idea is the, the computation you have is a single line, something like this here. Okay? You write something like this and you want to generate fast code for it. Okay? That was the, the first sort of step in this, in this project. Okay, so here is, uh, is, is the solution, uh, a program generator, we called it LGen. Uh, 
uh, it's a I can call it a basic linear algebra compiler. It takes in a basic linear algebra computation. It's like one line computation. And, uh, and the, the sizes, the dimensions of the operands are fixed. Okay, here's an extremely small scale example. A matrix is two by three, then there's a vector and you want to do this computation. Of course, it's very small, but you know, uh, just for the example. And then the, the generator goes through a few steps. And if you ever learned a bit about spirals and prior work, then it, it, it mimics, there's some principles that we borrowed from there. If you don't know spiral, it doesn't matter. And then in essence, we go through a sequence of domain specific representations of the computation to, to sort of lower um, the computation down to actually C code. And what do you need to get fast code? So one thing you have to do is uh, tiling, meaning block the computation somehow for locality. In this case, the locality is particularly important for the registers because we work for small sizes. So we do some form of uh, tiling or blocking and you see this depicted here. Um, then we further lower this expression to another representation that you see here, where um, in essence, loops become apparent. So the sum here becomes a loop and you, the data accesses become apparent. And you see this here in the square brackets. I, I'll show a little bit more later. So you have sort of the computation and you have gathers and scatters that tell you how to load and store data. And in this representation, you can do other optimizations. And then we further lower this to a kind of uh, intermediate represent, uh, kind of a CIR, like a, a C intermediate representation that is already very close to C, but is still at a bit at a higher level of abstraction where you can do some further optimizations before we then emit C code, possibly using intrinsics for vector instructions. Okay. And the idea is to do at every level certain transformations that are suitable for, for this level. Okay, so how does this work? So uh, let's walk briefly through it just to give you a, sort of a, a feeling of what's going on. Of course, there are all the details in the level, in, in the paper and in the thesis, if, if you want to know everything. So the first is tiling. And uh, remember, we want to do everything automatically. So we have to formalize it, we have to do it rigorously. So here's this, uh, an example, it's a very simple expression multiplying two small matrices. So um, we start by tiling and tiling means you assign the tile size to the entire computation like here, R and C is the, is the tile size. So for example, two and two, that sounds easy enough. But of course, what you need is you need tilings of the operands, okay? And how do you get this? You propagate the tiling decisions inside here and uh, one interesting thing that happens here, when you do this, you get new degrees of freedom, okay? So we started by tiling the computation as two, two, but then as you further go down and, and divide, uh, distribute over the A times B, you get the K as a possible additional decision. So I depict this here. So the K can be freely chosen and then becomes a parameter that we also use for, for auto-tuning because we can enumerate variables. Okay, so this tiles the computation, so to be performed on blocks, which is also common in these libraries that uh, work on, on larger scale computations. Okay, then the, the next requirement was we want to generate vector code, right? So all processors offer vector instructions and you want to use them because they make code faster. They offer a form of parallelism. So, and the vector length is a parameter. So typically vector length is like four or eight. Um, and we, of course, want to generate vector code. The basic idea uh, for doing this is very simple. Let's assume you have a vector length in your, of your architecture of mu. So mu uh, is like four, let's say, if you have SSE float or, or AVX double uh, for Intel processors. So then what you want to do is you want to, to divide the algorithm into pieces that, that fit that vector length very nicely, okay? And, um, and what that means is you divide it into blocks of size new, right? Makes a lot of sense. So for example, here in this case, you would block your matrices into little blocks of size new by new. And, uh, and as shown here, then you can propagate the tiling decision. Okay, so this is the vector length here. You can do additional tilings, but one tiling should be for the vector length. And then uh, when we, uh, so here's just a depiction of the next lower step. 
Um, so in this representation, for example, this then here is a new block. So you have a new binary matrix multiplied to a vector of length new. And this is another new block where you add two vectors of length new, okay? So the interesting thing here is that um, there are only a finite number of these new blocks, okay? Namely 18, okay? So all the vectors and matrices that have in essence shapes that are either of length new or length one, and they're exactly 18. And that's interesting because one of the goals of our generator was that it can be, ex it can be uh, ported to new vector architecture. So let's say, Intel decides to have suddenly uh, vector instructions for new equals 16, it should be possible with a straightforward engineering effort to port the generator to these vector instructions. And, we, and, uh, and how does that work? In essence, there's more work needed, of course, you need to implement these 18 new blocks sort of in a template form on the new architecture. And with a bit of more work around it, then in essence, you can port the generator. Okay, so that was the idea with the, with the new block and it was sort of the first sort of an interesting idea here. Okay, and then we need to first, we need to um, further compile our now tiled expression and we go to this next level that, that you see here. And uh, I just want to give a brief impression of what's going on here. Um, this, as I said before, the sum captures a loop and here these parentheses are gathers and scatters. They tell you how you read and write the data. You see this is a double loop. So in essence, it's a loop over the blocks and then the, the second loop index uh, goes inside the blocks. And in fact, all these are defined as, as mathematical, um, they're mathematically defined of course, but all these can be expressed actually as matrices. So this is still a mathematical expression. Okay, so you can evaluate it and you get back the original floor. So you can actually go back if you want. Okay, so the gathers and scatters do what you would expect. Uh, here just to give you an, an idea, right? So here the, the B, this is a gather. If, uh, if you extract B from A, this would look like this. And then the scatter is the opposite. If you take B and you want to scatter it into a larger matrix, then we put the brackets on, on the left side. Okay, so they, they, they formally, uh, capture data accesses. And because they are formally defined, you can actually manipulate them, you can fuse them, you can do optimizations, which is what we do. Okay. So uh, at this level, we can, as I said, we can fuse, get, fuse gathers and scatters and optimize. And then we lower further to a, a CIR. So here, these the scatters and gathers are logical accesses. And at one point, of course, you have to map this really to to actual physical accesses, meaning the matrices become arrays, the vectors become arrays and you get array accesses. And for this uh, purpose, um, Daniele designed sort of the CIR representation where that allows you to, uh, to, to do this. And it's still at a higher abstraction level than the actual C. And the idea is to perform some additional optimizations at this level before actually emitting the C code. And you see that the, 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 the gathers become loads, the, the, the scatters become stores and the computations, which are on the new blocks here, actually the new blocks are plugged in into the uh, computation. And there are of course, quite a number of more details I defer to, to the paper for this, but this is how it looks. And then we emit C code. Marcus, there's a question oh, uh, yes, from yes, Trolls. Yes. Okay, the question is, is tiling the computation for vectors of length one equivalent to not tiling at all? Uh, in principle, yes. Uh, however, I want to emphasize is that we can do multiple levels of tiling. So you definitely, uh, if you want to vectorize, you want definitely to tile once to get the new block structure, but it makes also a lot of sense. And usually we do it to have another level of tiling that in essence blocks into, into, uh, into blocks that fit nicely into registers, for example. So it, it makes sense for vector instruction also to, to, to tile twice. And if you don't have vectorization, you still want to tile to in essence improve locality. Good. So this is a sketch of the generator. And um, so let's have a look at some results that we achieved. Again, keep in mind, this is for blocks of fixed size. Um, I will show performance plots as you, as you have seen before, always on the x-axis is the input size. 
so the length of the vector or the, 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 the one dimension of the matrix and on the y-axis you see performance okay performance floating point operations per cycles higher is better and the peak performance of the machine that we consider here is eight but we never get above four so that's why the plots will look like this and everything is executed with warm cache so many repetitions and so here's an example uh, result so here you see a block up there uh, we just chose one that sort of includes all the computations that we cover uh, representative form that's a scalar you add matrices and multiply and so forth and here you see a comparison um, if you just write straightforward code um, you don't get very high performance um, there's Eigen, which is a C++ template library that does some optimizations, also supports vectorization, but doesn't perform uh, well here. You can implement it in MKL by invoking the respective uh, library functions. You see MKL achieves quite a good performance and, and we are above. Of course, we also benefit from specialization to the, to the size, but um, also from, from all the optimizations we do. I also want to emphasize that one particular nice feature here is that we handle all input sizes. So if you have ever vectorized code, uh, the moment the input size is like seven or 11, that becomes really, really nasty because you have cleanup code. And of course, all this is also generated. And, and, uh, and that's something that by hand you really would not want to do. Uh, the generation is, is automated, but the choice of block sizes and tile sizes and so on, that's manual. Is that right? Uh, no, it's uh, so some things are uh, some things we give to the search. Um, there is a search loop, so in this generator where we can enumerate some variants and uh, and pick the fastest. Okay, so for example, the, when I said there's a degree of freedom in, in in the tiling when we propagate in the tiling decision, that we include in the search. But for some other parts, so for example. Um, uh, so for for um, for some other parts, we actually um, took out the search, but but used a simple model instead. So for example, when we have nested loops that can be exchanged, we have a very simple model that tries to improve locality. Um, so so we did not want to to run a search over ten thousand variants, but but only over a few dozen. But yeah, there is some auto tuning going on. Excellent. And here are some other uh, here are some other examples. Small size. They mimic uh, what can be done with these so-called basic linear algebra subroutines that maybe many of you know. Type one, two, three, which allow you to do things like uh, scalar products, matrix vector multiplication, matrix matrix multiplication. And you see that uh, we, we, don't, we don't always win. Okay, of course this is a simple one. This is so-called Duxby. It's very simple. Um, we don't always win. But I want to point out one interesting thing. The, um, the ones that mark with three are matrix multiplications. And you see that, for example, the one, the E one this year, that MKL performs very well. Why is that? Because the, the shapes of the input matrices that we chose are very important for use in LAPEC. And so the MKL is very optimized for these shapes. Okay, so you see, we, we don't really improve. But if you just change the shape, so you go to the plot next to it, this is something that in LAPEC is not needed. And you see how MKL performs much poorer. But of course, our generator doesn't care about special cases and, and generates code that has sort of a similar quality. Okay, so that's one particularity about this large size linear algebra. The routines are optimized for use in, in scientific computing and, and for, for LAPEC kind of functions. And when you step a bit away from this, um, very often the performance may not be good anymore. And in fact, since the theme here is tensor computations, there you see this already, right? If you do matrix multiplication within higher dimensional tensors, the glass libraries were not designed for this, okay? So you, that's why there's a lot of work going on now to, to improve. Okay. Anyway, so this was uh, worked well, and um, it's a generator for blocks, as you can see. I mentioned before this idea that you can port to new vector, vector architectures with just engineering effort, no research. We tried this out with a, with a master student who did a master thesis. We told him, look, here's ARM Cortex. It has a different vector architecture called NEON. Port the new blocks 
to neon and then whatever else needs to be done to port the generator. And he could actually do it without prior knowledge and like, of course, took three months or so. And uh, you see an, on ARM, of course, very different processor. Uh, they actually, we, we got uh, quite a lot of improvement. And of course, there is no NKL here okay, that you can compare against. Good, so that was the part on luck. Okay, let me check. Okay, the question is for explicit data caching, can there be a case where data batching can be preferred in instead of tiling? Oh, I see. Um, for example, okay. Okay, the question is, um, can it be the case that sometimes you don't want to tile, but in, in essence, you want to batch many small computations together? Um, and in essence, uh, and, and the answer is absolutely yes. Okay, so if the application allows it, then uh, a common optimization is to, to really batch many small linear algebra computations together and then optimize over the batch. And of course that requires, if you implement this in a library, a particular interface to support this. And, uh, and this is another example of why the small scale is different than the large scale, where typically you would not do that. There's another question from Peter, just before that. Ah, could you outline what underlies the search you're describing? Um, the, in essence, any degree of freedom that appears in the generator, you can give to the search and, and in essence, allow the search to, 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 to explore different choices. And then you just live with the fact that you generate 1000 variants for the same computation, okay? Um, and, and as I said before, one example was this, this tiling, this degree of freedom and tiling uh, that I showed in the beginning, right? You can choose the tile size that you want and you can iterate over different tile sizes. And as you propagate in the tiles, you get additional degrees of freedom. So I think the tiling choice is probably the most important tuning parameter that we use tonight, okay? What small tiles do we want? I hope that explains. Okay, let's come to now step two. So after we did the blocks, we said, okay, let's take it one level further and take in structure. So that means we allow for matrices that have structure because the structure should allow you to do things faster. And here's an example. L stands for lower triangular, U for an upper triangular matrix and S for a symmetric matrix, okay? So this is a block, but with structured matrices. So we go back to our generator, which is how it looks before. And there's only like a small difference. Uh, namely here, you can now specify for a matrix that it has a surface structure. That's the idea, okay? And you want to specify this in the input and then you want to benefit from it by generating better code. So for, for doing this, you need to have, uh, so, okay, a design goal was here to be extensible, okay? We didn't just want to hard code sort of lower triangular, upper triangular and symmetric matrices, but we wanted to have a setup where you can come in with your favorite structure and if it's sort of within sort of limits, right? And, and the generator can incorporate this, okay? So that's, that motivates, motivated this general approach for, for handling this. So a generic way of describing structure. And here we built on uh, ideas from the, from the community that does polyhedral computation because they deal a lot with kind of issues of this kind. And here's an example of a specification of structure. And in the implementation, we use the, the integer set library that you see here that's very much used in this polyhedral community. So here up there is a specification of a lower triangular matrix. Okay. And, um, and the key here is the G and the Z. In essence, the G says this is a generic entry and the Z says this is a zero entry. Okay, very straightforward. And you see the G here, the domain that is specified is uh, the, the lower part, the lower triangular half. Uh, and it says these entries are generic. And the Z says this is the upper part here is the upper part is zero. Okay, so we have type G generic and type C zero. And you could imagine having a type one, which says all these entries should be one. Okay, and this LA info says how you should access the matrix, which is not so interesting here. How do you specify a symmetric matrix? 
you, uh, the idea of a symmetric matrix here is that it's given as also in these blast libraries as a full matrix uh, in, in format, but you always only access the, up, the upper triangle or the, or the lower triangle. Okay, so here you see that um, G, this is a generic, these are generic entries all over the matrix, but this here is the access function. And what it does is it says that if you access the lower triangle, just access it. But if you access the upper triangle, flip the indices, meaning you access the lower triangle, okay? And you can imagine uh, that with these specifications, you can describe many shapes, uh, that, that many other shapes beyond those that you see. Okay, so now we had to incorporate, oops, sorry, we had to incorporate this into the generator. And there we also imported some tools for the, for the polyhedral uh, domain. So in essence, to make, uh, to make use of this information, okay? And, uh, and here we use this prior work uh, clue, which is from the polyhedral domain, which in essence takes um, <clears throat> a polyhedral iteration space and generates possible loop codes from that, okay? And it's all very technical, and, and I just want to, to give you a flavor of what's going on here, uh, pictorially, so to speak. Um, so imagine you have this computation here, lower times upper triangular, then uh, what we would do conceptually, we would uh, decompose the computation into the regions. And we know the regions, right? Because in the spec of these matrices, we have the regions. There's the G region and the Z region, and they could, of course, have other shapes. So we, we decompose them, and then we can, the tool, of course, can automatically figure out if that, if one part is a Z, like a zero, then, then they will go away. And in essence, we stick only with these two parts on the computation, all derived automatically. Um, and then um, we need, in essence, um, from that, we need to generate uh, um, uh, the loop iteration space. So now we have this multiplication. It has three loop indices. And uh, this is sort of how polyhedral people think about the iteration space. It's three-dimensional. You see here, this is a three-dimensional iteration space. Then we had to convert this into a format that can be input to Klug, and Klug takes this, takes this iteration space and generates a possible looped implementation of it, which is a triple loop, okay, that traverses this space. And there are various options, okay? And we chose to use a model, again, that, that kind of tries to optimize locality to, in essence, not explore different uh, loop um, uh, ways of traversing the space, but pick one deterministically here. Uh, but since we want to further process it into our generator, we needed the back end to, in essence, bring it back to our gather and scatter uh, representation to then further process it. Okay. Okay. So this was a high level representation. And also here, we got actually a master student to try out what can we do. And, um, and we implemented, the master student implemented some other shapes. Okay. So it was possible to have shapes like this. You see, for example, here's a diagonal block. Uh, to describe this with this framework and then generate uh, a, a code for it that takes advantage for it. And taking advantage of it means that actually you can reduce the number of operations because of the redundancy. Okay, so here are some results. This again is a, uh, an example of computation that I showed in the beginning, lower times upper triangular plus symmetric. Uh, and here again, you see some performance plots. Uh, again, our code is generated specific to the size, so it always gives a slight advantage over, over libraries that are general size, like MKL, but you see we get performance improvements here. These here are nasty sizes. They are not divisible by the vector, the, the Cindy vector length. And these here are the nice sizes, which are divisible by the vector length, okay? And here is a comparison is Lgen without. So if we ignore the structure, meaning we cannot reduce the number of operations, you see we get a much lower performance than here. Okay, so it's, it's like two X slower. Okay, so then we had structures, so to say covered with another paper and went up in the stack to consider higher level so by high level linear algebra, uh, I mean things like Koleski factorization, U factorization, triangular solve, 
So here you see some of these are typically uh, for the larger scale implemented in an APEC, but uh, you can think of others. Um, so also those that are typically provided by libraries. And then we started a collaboration uh, with uh, Diego and Paolo that you see here. The Paolo, uh, very well known for his early work on, on flame at UT Austin with Robert van der Gein, he's in Aachen. And meanwhile, actually he's in Sweden, in Umea as a full professor. Okay, so what, so we won't let's take Koleski factorization as an example. So if you take a matrix and you want to factor it as U transpose U, we use upper triangular. Um, and the work that the Paolo and his team had done was the automatic synthesis of blocked algorithms for these kind of functions. Okay, so for example, for Koleski, they have a they have built a tool that can automatically generate a blocked computation. Blocked because blocking is important for performance. And here you see a typical sort of textual depiction of what they generate. So this is an algorithm and it explains how the Koleski factorization is done in a blocked way, where in essence you move um, through different blocks doing the computation, okay? And if you actually want to implement this, you need blast routines because the actual computations that are needed to execute is need blast. So, so it assumes the availability of blast functions, okay? Meaning basic matrix and vector computations. Okay? And the cool thing of their work, not our work, their work is that this algorithm is automatically synthesized and they have built a tool and it builds on prior work that was not automated in, in Flay, okay? But yeah, in essence, it builds on blast. And I just want to um, give a very quick idea of what they do. It's, it's also quite involved, but it's very beautiful. So if you like that kind of thing, I recommend that you look at, at their work. Um, so here, just a glimpse. So the input is what you want to do. Okay, so here is the, the specification here of a, um, of a Koleski factorization. And that's the input and the output is the algorithm, okay? And how does it work? They, uh, they automatically tile the, the computation. Then um, from the tiled expression by multiplying together, you can get equations that need to hold. Um, here you get in essence, this, uh, these are the computations on the blocks. And then as they describe, uh, you can, uh, do a dependence analysis on the expressions. So here you see the dependencies. And then you can automatically generate possible loop invariants for the blocked computation. So that's the cool part that you can, with this information, you can consider subsets of these and automatically check them whether they would, would make good loop invariants. And once you have the loop invariants, and the loop is the, the one that goes over the different blocks in the computation. And once you have the loop invariant from that, you generate the algorithm. So it's a very nice and principled approach. So here's an example looped invariant. Don't ask me to, to explain every detail of it, but from that you can you can generate the implementation. Good. So it was a natural fit for us because it provides the upper level. And of course, what we did instead of then having an algorithm as they had before that requires plus, we just thought we connected with LJ. So that means the, the computation on the pieces which require blast we would custom generate them in LGEN with some extensions, so you kind of with the right interfaces to hook it in, um, to in essence generate standalone, standalone code that doesn't require a BLAST library, but standalone code for fixed size Koleski factorization, like for example, you need in the current version. Okay. So it was a bit of engineering work, but then once the two uh, tools uh, put together, it's, it's kind of nice standalone code um, specialized to the size. Okay, um, so here's an example of, of what we can do. So this is the Koleski factorization that was mentioned before. An interesting thing about their approach is because they can identify different possible loop invariants as valid, they can generate actually different algorithms, different blocked algorithms. And because we have a generator, um, of course we can explore all of them. If you download Koleski factorization in LAPEC, it is blocked, but it's only one algorithm based on one loop invariant. So they can generate variants. So here you see again a, a, a comparison. 
Um, there's MKL again. Um, there's RELAPEC, which is specific for, for Koleski. And you see our code, we can, you see we can get speed up. Uh, you see also this dashed line. These are algorithmic variants that they could generate uh, uh, at the high level. And then when we generate the entire code, they will suboptimize. Okay, so picking the set line over the dashed ones is sort of uh, algorithmic auto tune, right? So consider three algorithms and pick the best. It gets much more interesting in Sylvester here. This is a Sylvester equation that's relevant in control theory and some other areas. It's not so relevant in scientific computing. So if you know LAPEC, the, the solving the Sylvester equation is not in there. So here's the equation you solve for X. And, um, uh, but there are specialized libraries. Uh, so MKL, uh, um, actually MKL, yes, provides it actually. Rexy is implemented to provide it, but also optimized for large scale. But what was interesting is that their tool identified 64 valid loop invariants, 64, right? So 64 different algorithms for solving Sylvester equation. And of course, maybe half of them don't make sense when you look a little bit at them because they're suboptimal in performance. But the cool thing was, since we had the end-to-end -end generation approach, we could in essence generate all code for all of them and, uh, and, and pick the fastest, right? And here I just show some near competitors. And, uh, and that was nice because many of them that they could generate were never before implemented even by hand. So that's kind of a nice little uh, side uh, thing. And here's uh, the triangular, um, triangular inverse, okay? Okay, so that was the higher level computations. And that means there's only one level missing to bringing it up to the Kalman filter, because now what we need to do to get something like Kalman filter, we need to combine all these things. So that brings us to, to the last piece. We want to do something like this. And you see, in essence, we have already all the pieces. We just need to stitch them somehow together. And for that, you need to uh, design a language that allows you to, to describe uh, the linear algebra computations. So you can immediately think of MATLAB, but of course, uh, MATLAB uh, is, is not far away for our purposes, but of course, we had some special requirements to, to make this whole thing work, um, a way to specify properties of matrices or the particular ways in which we wanted to express the computations. Uh, so we decided to implement sort of our own language. And of course, we needed to expand beyond what you see, because sometimes you need signs and cosines and exponentials and, and scalar operations that, that you just need sort of as, as, uh, as additional pieces to, to build a, a, a real application um, in small scale in algebra. So, so we built a language. And then here's sort of a formal depiction, but conceptually, you may imagine what works as we, we can write now a linear algebra program. In essence, the goal is to extract the pieces of the computations that are in there. Here's a Koleski, here's a matrix vector multiplication and generate code for them and then piece it all together. However, there's a little bit more going on there because we can do this piecing together all within our framework. And that allows to a, a limited, but still some extent to do cross computation optimization. So maybe you have a, one computation followed by another and you can optimize across them, okay? By maybe fusing some data accesses or things like this. So this also could be done in this framework. And um, yeah, so we built it. And, uh, and with that, then finally we could, we actually reached a goal that was set in the beginning. And in fact, it was really set in the beginning of the thesis. Uh, so it was nice that, uh, that Daniele achieved it can we generate code for a common filter of fixed size? In our language, it looks a bit like this here. I stripped away some of the ugly parts like uh, specifications of maybe structure of the matrices. Um, what's also a bit special here is that we have uh, in implicit um, assignments, right? So what's underlined here are outputs, okay? So for example, if we solve uh, a system, then we write it as a product and just say that this is the output. And we do this because the synthesis tool from Paolo's group requires this kind of representation. So it would, it would look like this. And then um, the tool, uh, the compiler generator, synthesis plus compiler um, will generate code. And 
you will see we manage to get a good speed up for, this, uh, for the small sizes. And again, you see there's some variance, but not a big difference. Here, I change the two parameters of the Kalman filter, two main parameters, number of states, number of observations, and we achieve some speed up. It's automatically generated code. It doesn't need any libraries. It is, um, uh, it is specified uh, for the task and the code size is, uh, is, uh, is likely smaller than what you need by, you know, instead of, um, if you don't need to, to use all these libraries. And then of course we picked some other case studies just to see what else can we do. Um, and of course, many linear algebra computations that you pick from a book are maybe out of scope because they had additional elements. So it's not that we have now a tool that can solve everything or has the generality of MATLAB, but still here are just two, two problems that we found in the literature and that we considered. And, uh, and you see here some performance plot. We could here get a bit of a speed up down here. It doesn't look so glorious. Um, I think that we realized there's a bit more work to be done to, um, in terms of optimizing performance when things get more complex. But you know, at one point also the nicest thesis has to end in the interest of the student and, and sort of the project came, came to an end here. And not only the project, but also my talk comes here to an end. So let me just uh, conclude. So I showed you an approach for uh, program generation for small linear algebra, small scale linear algebra. I want to add here that the original motivation for this project came actually from the interlibrary team. Because back when I was at Carnegie Mellon some 10 plus years ago, uh, we generated uh, lots of FFT code, fast Fourier transform code and similar functions for the Intel library, Intel IPP in this case, and worked uh, regularly, uh, interacted with the library team. And, and they were always asking us, can you do small scale linear algebra? Because it's really different than what you need in the large scale. And, uh, and I always had this in the back of my head. And when I moved to ATI, I thought maybe it's time now to, to try this out. So that's where the motivation came from. And the way we tech, uh, tackle this is by starting from the simplest case of computation and moving up to more complicated things and always aiming for a principled approach that is formal, rigorous, has some elegance to it, or can argue that, and that is extensible. Okay, we, we didn't want, we wanted to hard code as little as possible. Um, and so that it's extensible, at least in a, in a research sense, conceptually extensible. Okay, and you, and you saw the examples with extending to vector architectures and extending to um, um, two different structures of matrices, okay? So at that time, actually, there had been very little to no work being done on, on trying to automatically optimize small linear algebra. So it was kind of uh, virgin territory, so to say. We borrowed principles from prior work on spirals, or if you have ever seen a talk on spiral, the idea of, of having representations that make scatters and gathers explicit and to be able to, to manipulate at that level comes from spiral, for example. Extensibility as mentioned was the goal. We achieved some good speed ups. And um, actually since then uh, the um, sort of uh, many more people got interested in small linear algebra and there's meanwhile a bunch of other works. Uh, I should have probably put a slide there listing some of them, but uh, I. I realized too late here by uh, sort of updating a bit the presentation. So there's meanwhile more work if, and, and really nice work. If you just look at, at some papers that, that cite ours, you, you will find some, some works trying to also to define BLAS interfaces, including batching, for example, uh, in the interface for, for small scale computations. So there's nice other work. And with that, I conclude and thank you very much for your attention. Great, thank you very much, Marcus.